better? Okay, great. Over the past two years, we've hosted a number of speakers, as you can see here, most of whom their recordings are available on our website. We've had about 3,000 people joining our series from over 150 institutions all over the world. Thank you so much for helping us make this event successful. We have a fantastic lineup of West Coast speakers coming up, including today's speaker, Professor Kalani Grosspector, and then we have Russ Poldrak, Terry Jernigan, and Mary Lou Gorna Tempini. Then we, after that, we return to the East Coast in the fall with Alex Martin and Mariah Thomason, among others. So please stay tuned and sign up to receive information about future talks and past recordings by emailing burke at uconn.edu. Some housekeeping items that you know all know by now, you will be muted and we usually try a muting to clap before and after the talk. I'll see if I'm in the mood for another failure. I've never really succeeded or feel, felt confident that I went well, but I really like the clapping feeling. So I apologize, it's pretty old school, but I might try it again. If you have questions, please enter in the chat box and we'll take most of the questions at the end. So let's get started. Today is my greatest pleasure to introduce Professor Kalani Grosspector, um, whom I have admired for the longest time for her great science, upbeat attitude and never ending curiosity that drives her fabulous work. She's Professor of Psychology and the Neurosciences Institute at Stanford University. As most of you know, her research examines how the brain processes visual information such as people, objects, and places using various in vivo human imaging techniques and how we perceive them. She also investigates how these changes with development but probably she's the best, she's best known for her work pioneering the field of fMRI adaptation, which many of us in imaging use today. She received her PhD from the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel, studying with Raphael, uh, Raphael Malak, and was a postdoctoral fellow in brain and cognitive sciences at MIT with Nancy Kanwisher before joining Stanford University as faculty. She has received many awards and honors, including the Human Sciences Frontier Fellowship, the Sloan Fellowship, and so on. She has served as the editor of the Journal of Vision and Neuropsychologia. She published widely and frequently in high impact journals such as Science, Nature Neuroscience, Annual Reviews in Neuroscience, TICS, and PNAS. I first met, I always like putting in something personal if I can, so, so it's going to be a little personal, I won't cry, but I first met her in person in 2002 when I was a pre-doc at Caltech and Kalani was assistant professor just starting out at Stanford University. She might not remember this, but I do remember it really well. When we both served on NSF's inaugural uh, cognitive neuroscience program review panel, many of us probably um, have these imprinting experiences in science, but I, so I remember this really well as a student and how I was thrilled to have a glass of wine waiting for a flight, I, I believe, and uh, how mesmerized I was at how fast she spoke, as well as her contagious smiles and her brilliant mind. And her, oh, and then I checked her out online for her publications, and then I found out that she was an artist as well. I think it might be still on her website. She has great paintings if you get a chance to see them. Um, I have since listened to her speak several times. Having done a postdoc at Stanford myself in the Department of Psychology, where she is, but today is a particularly uh, an honor for me that I get to hear uh, host her talk. So, with this, please join me in welcoming Professor Kalani Grosspector. And I might try to unmute everyone. So, let me see if I can do this. Um, it's saying mute all. I am not having much luck here. Okay, I'm not gonna do this, but you can visually show um, and clap if you like to, or unmute yourself if you feel like it. I apologize, I don't do so well when I have to do everything myself as well. But, um, so I see a lot of people clapping, and Kalani, welcome. So thank you very much, uh, Fumiko, for this really uh, very kind and gracious introduction. I uh, absolutely remember our first meeting at the NSF panel. This was also my first NSF panel meeting and I was really new to everything. And I remember our uh, chatting uh, um, in, in DC before going back and it was wonderful to meet you then. And I have followed your work since as well. So it's always good to reconnect. So uh, I do apologize that I do speak fast. So I hope I'm not gonna speak uh, too fast in today's uh, talk, but um, anyway. 
So uh, let me share. Um, oh, I think Fumiko, you need to stop sharing screen. Okay. Let me share my screen with you guys. Can you see the whole screen for me, Go? Okay, thank you. So today I'm gonna to talk about a work that I've done in my lab over the last uh, decade or so. And um, it's work with many uh, postdoctoral student, uh, students and um, graduate students, as well as research assistants, who you all see uh, here. And they're the main uh, contributors uh, to the work that I'm gonna be describing. Uh, today. Okay, so the field I am is an intersection between behavior, brain function, and uh, anatomy. And this is a field that uh, is called cognitive neuroanatomy. And this is a term that's been coined by my firm, former student and postdoc, uh, Kevin Weiner. So I'm going to just as a beginning, you know, to introduce you why I'm really interested in the intersection of these three things. And I'm going to start by describing that the behaviors that I'm particularly interested in, and that's a visual recognition. I'm having a hard time moving my slides. Okay, so uh, the reason I'm interested in visual recognition is that it's really important for our everyday uh, actions and social interactions. Uh, so recognizing faces and reading words is really important for our everyday lives. And um, it's also a skill that develops across the lifespan. Uh, we are better at recognizing faces as adults than we were in children. And obviously we have to go to school in order to learn to read. The other reason that I'm interested in the system is that we know a lot about how the system is functionally implemented in the brain. So I'm showing you here is a ventral view of an inflated brain of a subject. This is occipital lobe, this is a frontal lobe. And when the subject looks at an object in the world, light gets reflected from that object into your retina, and then the information is transmitted to the back of the brain, to this uh, occipital lobe where primary visual cortex resides. And then through a series of computation, what we call the ventral visual processing stream, information reaches this ventral aspect of the temporal lobe, which we call ventral temporal cortex, which, and I'm gonna also refer to it as VTC, and a percept emerges. For example, you might recognize that you're looking at a bird. What's really cool about this ventral temporal cortex is that is there are very clear patterns of activations when you look at images of different categories. And indeed, a lot of researchers have shown that just by looking at the pattern of activation across ventral temporal cortex, you can read out with an independent classifier what category of stimuli the subject is looking at, for example, if it's a face or a hand. In addition, there's a lot of research mainly started by Nancy Kenrisher's group and Stan DeHaan's group showing that there's regions that seem to be clustered and specialized for processing stimuli of several ecologically relevant categories. And there's only a handful of regions that seem to be specialized in ventral temporal cortex, and I'm gonna talk about all of them today. So again, if we're looking on the right side of the screen, when we look at ventral temporal cortex, this is an individual subject's brain. You'll find, if you look at the left hemisphere, two patches shown here in black on the occipital temporal sulcus that seem to be selective for processing words. You'll see also on the occipital temporal sulcus, a patch shown here in yellow that seems to be uh, selective to body parts and especially limbs. On the fusiform gyrus, you'll also find uh, two patches that are uh, selective for faces. And on the collateral sulcus shown here in green, you'll find uh, patches that seem to be selective for places. And I'm showing you these regions and going to detail because one of the things that intrigued us that this kind of functional organization is super consistent across people and also super consistent with anatomical landmark. So let me show you this in a little bit more detail. So if you take a cross section uh, in the middle of the ventral temporal cortex and you zoom on a coronal slice, if you look at the middle, you'll see on the bottom here is this fusiform gyrus, which is kind of flat. It's flanked by the occipital temporal sulcus on the lateral side and the collateral sulcus on the medial side. And in the middle of the fusiform gyrus, there's this little sulcus called the fusiform sulcus, which is shown here in this divot here in the middle. 
And one of the things that we found when looking at a lot of brains is that there's, uh, and I'm talking about hundreds of brains, is that there's a really uh, consistent relationship between where functional regions location and this anat anatomical landmark. In, in particular, the MFS is a good predictor of where face selective regions lo are located. And again, in this cross section, you would find that the face selective region is on the lateral aspect of the fusiform gyrus, just lateral to the MFS. Another thing that we've uh, uh, um, measured is how consistent are the place selective regions relative to anatomy. And again, if you look at here at this as intersection between this anterior lingual sulcus and collateral sulcus, or shown here as this V on the coronal slice, you'll find that along this location in cortex, uh, this place selective regions are very likely to be found. So this really intrigued us, why is function so intimately coupled with anatomy? So some independent work was in Carl Zillis lab and Katrine Ammon's lab has identified cytoarchitectonic regions in the ventral stream, including regions in the fusiform gyrus. And for example, they found that in the lateral fusiform gyrus, this is this area called fusiform gyrus 4 or FG4, has a different cytoarchitecture, meaning the distribution of cells across layers, than a different region on the medial side of the fusiform gyrus and the collateral sulcus called FG3. And in working with them, we actually found this curious finding that this mid fusiform sulcus is a really good predictor of the boundary between these cytoarchitectonic regions that were defined independently. And indeed, if you put like the functional regions on top of these cytoarchitecture regions, you found that there is a strong coupling between a function and microstructure. And in particular, the phase selective regions align with FG4 and the place selective regions align with FG3. So we thought that this is really interesting because it might suggest that part of this anatomical consistency is actually the microstructure. And second, that this unique microstructure might suggest that there's some differential hardware between face and place selective regions that might contribute to their specialization. So basically up to now, all I told you why I'm really interested in the ventral stream. And the reason is, is that I think it's a really good model system to investigate the develop of specialization in the brain and this intimate relationship between brain function, brain anatomy and behavior. So after this uh, introduction, what I really want to dive in into the questions that I will try to address in this talk today. So the big picture questions um, are the following. First, what are the functional and structural developments that occur in the ventral stream from childhood to adulthood? And more importantly, how do these developments lead to enhanced visual recognition behavior in adults compared to children? So before I show you some data, I did want to give you a sense of what are the developmental series that are underlying this field. So, Largely construed, there are two big series. One is a series of pruning and the other is a series of growth. And the series of pruning is based from histological analysis, mostly in animals that has measured uh, properties of the microstructure from childhood to adulthood. And for example, this is a classical study from Pascal Rakik showing that uh, if you look across development, this is in monkey V1, Initially, you have a lot of synapses forming immediately after birth, but this there is a lot, then there's a subsequent decline of the number of synapses following this. And basically, this idea is that uh, the brain is uh, development is associated with pruning of unnecessary synapses and connections. And this pruning might help uh, increase selectivity by reducing connections and inputs from irrelevant stimuli. The other theory is a theory is that is called proliferation or growth. And this theory is also based on a largely histological work in, in monkeys. This is data from Elston and Fujita in macaque IT, which is an analog of human ventral temporal cortex. And they measure both the number of synapses and the size of dendritic arbors. And they actually documented that these both the dendritic arbors and the number of synapses really grow a lot from birth to adulthood. 
And this uh, growth in dendritic arbor synapses and connection might uh, contribute to changes in neural pooling and might increase selectivity and in responses to uh, relevant stimuli. So what I'm gonna attempt to do in this talk is to perform structural and functional measurements that might contribute evidence to either pruning or proliferation series of brain development, and then evaluate uh, based on brain data if there are any behavioral consequences to structural and functional development. So let's start with the structural predictions. And the very uh, high level pruning predicts a decrease in deve across development in cortical tissue and proliferation uh, predicts increases in cortical tissue. Now, one of the problems is that all the prior work uh, is done in like postmortem tissue of animals, and I'm really interested in studying awake behaving human beings. So the question is, how can we try to address these series with a, a imaging work? So uh, we were intrigued by some methods that were developed at Stanford by Aviv Metzer and colleagues, and in parallel, there were other developments by Nick Weisskopf um, uh, at uh, the Max Planck Institute. And these uh, uh, physicists develop methods called quantitative MRI or QMRI that measure um, um, the relaxation properties of the brain by titrating the flip angle and inversion recovery times. And the reason that these, so about what these measurements give you, they give you a T1 map uh, of the brain. And this is important because this, this measurements of how long it takes to protons to to relax um, in seconds is really related to the macromolecular tissue volume or how much tissue versus water you have in a voxel. So as you have more tissue uh, in a voxel, so MTV uh, increases, T1 relaxation subsequently decreases. So we now have some way to measure with uh, imaging uh, microstructural properties of the tissue. The other thing, so just to give you an intuition, if, if we look at this coronal slice, if we look at the ventricle, so this is a space that is largely fluid, we have really long T1 relaxation times in the order of three or four seconds. But if we look at the white matter that's highly myelinated um, and it's very tissue dense, we have short T1 relaxation times that are less than one second. The other reason that we like these T1 measurements is unlike other measurements like functional MRI, they give us measurements in seconds that are units, meaning that we can compare them across individuals, across span, uh, scanners, um, and that would be maybe like a temperature measurement that could give you some indication of the state of the human, uh, even though it cannot measure things at the molecular or cellular level. So how can we use this method of quantitative MRI to look at these series of development? So let's look at pruning. Pruning predicts that from childhood to adulthood, the tissue becomes less dense. So if you're a proton that's kind of uh, flipping in this environment, when you're an adult, you'll have less tissue to exchange your energy with compared to your child state. And this wouldn't predict an increase in the T1 relaxation time from childhood to adulthood. In contrast, if tissue grows from childhood to adulthood, the proton will be more tissue dense environment in adulthood is in childhood, and therefore we would predict a developmental decrease in T1 relaxation time. So now this gives us a clear prediction of what we should expect. So to test these predictions, we measured uh, in our favorite part of the brain, um, functional uh, regions in each uh, individual. Um, so these are just examples of some of the individuals who participated in our study. And then within each of these functional regions, uh, we measure the T1 relaxation time across ages. And here I'm gonna focus on two kinds of regions, the phase selective regions shown here in red and the place selective regions here shown here in yellow. So uh, let's first look at how T1 um, um, changes uh, across development. We're gonna measure uh, T1 in children between five to 12 year olds and um, in adults that are between 22 to 28 year olds. So if you measure the mean uh, T1 relaxation time uh, in children, you'll see it's higher than in adults in this region. 
And if you look at the distribution of T1 values across voxels in this region, you can see that the values are shifted to the left or are lower in the adults in the darker curve compared to children. And this is again consistent with the prediction of the proliferation hypothesis because we see a developmental decrease in T1 relaxation time from childhood to adulthood. If we do the same kind of measurements in the same children and adults in the place selective regions, we see a different pattern of development and where we actually do not see a, a significant development of T1 relaxation time from childhood to adulthood, uh, either on the mean uh, T1 values or on the distribution. So this is kind of interesting because we don't see a uniform development of tissue properties across ventral temporal cortex. And this suggests that uh, face selective regions structural property developed longer than the tissue properties of place selective regions. So now that we find structural development, you might ask, how does the structural and development impact brain function? So what we wanted to do is measure how selective uh, our regions are across development. So we measure selectivity as a T value, uh, indicating how more responsive it is to faces compared to the other categories that subjects saw in the experiment. So if you expect some developmental increase in selectivity, you'll expect higher value on the y-axis, and uh, as we showed, there's more macromolecular tissue in adults than in children, so we would expect decreases um, in T1 values. So this scatter plot shows the data from all our participants. Each dot is a participant. The children are in circles and the adults are in diamonds. And what you can see is that there is a significant negative correlation between selectivity and T1 relaxation. So basically, as the fusiform gyrus becomes more tissue dense, selectivity to faces increases. And this is interesting that structural and functional um, development are significantly linked. If we look in the same participants in the place selective regions, uh, while there's variability in the T1 relaxation times and in the selectivity level, we do not see a significant relationship between selectivity and uh, T1 relaxation time, suggesting that the regions that are functionally developing are also structurally developing. So to see if this also has an um, effect on development, we wondered if both functional and structural development might affect face recognition abilities. So in our face, in, this, in our same participants, we evaluated their face recognition ability outside the, the scanner. And the way we evaluated it is that we ran a Cambridge face recognition test using child faces. The reason that we're interested in using child faces is because we were wondering if children just see more child faces in the environment and maybe they're better at recognizing children. So we wanted to make a test that would be more suitable for children. So in this test, what happens, there is a training stage that you would see six faces. These faces rotate a little bit, and then you're asked to remember these six individual faces. Then each participant participates in 72 trials that look like this. These are the test trials. And in the test trials, you're gonna see three faces, and you're supposed to indicate which of these three faces you've seen uh, in the training phase. And as the test proceeds, the trials become more and more difficult because faces are shown in new views and with some level uh, of noise. So now we can measure how each participant did in face recognition, which is a y-axis and uh, in related to their structural properties in the face area. And we find again, a significant negative correlation between face recognition ability and T1 uh, relaxation. So as the tissue of the fusiform gyrus becomes more tissue dense, face recognition becomes significantly better. And this relationship remains significant when we partial out age. This is not correlated with tissue properties in the place selective regions and also place recognition uh, memory does not uh, um, correlate with a T1 relaxation time in this place selective areas. So in the first study, I showed you that we have some imaging evidence that at least in the fusiform gyrus, we have 
tissue proliferation from childhood to adulthood. And it's interesting that this tissue proliferation is correlated with increased face selectivity and better face recognition performance across childhood development. So we see the specific link between structure, function, and behavior. But you might not be convinced that this is really what's happening. And maybe you could think about other evidences that might support this pruning hypothesis. So one piece of evidence that you might think that would support a this hypothesis of pruning is other evidence that comes from a lot of labs that have measured how sick cortex is a, a, across the lifespan. And there's a large body of work that suggested, so it shows that as you go from children that are five to nine year olds to young adults that are 22 to 20 year old, um, there's a decrease in the sickness of cortex. Basically cortex in children is sicker than cortex in adults. So this might be some evidence that might support uh, pruning because cortex seems to be, be lost, basically. However, an alternative hypothesis might be that what is really changing is not how much cortex you have, but what's inside the cortex. And one factor that people haven't really considered much is myelin. And the reason that we became interested in myelin is because myelin affects the contrast of MR images and it might affect where we put the boundary between white and gray matter. So the cortex might appear to be thinner, what, what really it's not really losing tissue, it just becomes brighter in MRI images. So the question is, does cortex thin or look thinner due to pruning that tissue is lost or just does it become more myelinated during childhood development? Of course, to measure myelin in tissue, we really need to do some histology. And so the question is, how can we do uh, histology? It's really hard to do histology in, in, in child brains because children don't die young, which is a good thing. And a lot of the uh, postmodern brains are in adults. So how can we leverage adult uh, postmortem tissue to address this question of myelination in cortex? Um, let me just go here. And, one of the ways that we can leverage uh, this uh, adult postmortem data is an observation from our previous studies. As I showed you, face selective cortex uh, seems to become more tissue dense during development, but place selective cortex doesn't. So if we look at face and place selective uh, cortex in children, you can see that their T1 properties are not differentiated. But if you look at adults, you can see that the T1 properties of face selective cortex are lower because it's more tissue dense than the collateral sulcus, which remains in the same density as its childhood state. So what we could do is leverage adult data and compare tissue properties of um, face versus place selective cortex and see if that is related to myelin. So if we go back to our developmental hypothesis, pruning would suggest that as you have uh, less tissue, you should have higher cortical thickness, and we would predict a negative relationship between cortical thickness and T1. However, the proliferation hypothesis predicts the opposite, that as tissue becomes more dense, maybe with myelin, you should have thinner uh, cortex, meaning that you should find a positive relationship. So before, so before we went and measured myelin in postmortem brains, we actually wanted to see if there's a coupling between cortical sickness and T1 properties in our participants. So we measured our favorite areas, our face selective regions shown here on the left, and our place selective in our word selective regions shown here in the right. And you can see um, that we have a strong positive relationship between cortical sickness and T1. So basically, thinner cortex is associated with denser uh, cortex, both in face selective regions and in word selective regions on the occipital temporal sulcus. So this supports that, again, this uh, gross hypothesis, and let's then look if it's related to myelin. So in this work, we, co we, correlated, uh, we collaborated with a lab of uh, Nick Weisskopf and especially with Evgenia Kirilina, who is a research scientist in this lab. And we obtained um, five postmortem brains of adults. 
And basically we identified the fusiform gyrus, the occipital temporal sulcus and the collateral sulcus because we know that our functional regions are anatomically consistent across these regions. And what Evgenia Karolina did is that she stained these tissue samples for myelin. So this is basically a stained tissue sample. And you can see that the darker it is, for example, in the white matter, we have more myelin that appears to be black or darker in this slice. So if you, I can have your attention here on the right side of the slice. So this red indicates the lateral fusiform gyrus. And this is where we expect the face selective regions. And one of the things that really struck us is that there's a lot of myelin in cortex in the face selective region. And it actually goes about halfway through cortex. If you look at the collateral sulcus here shown here in yellow, we can see also myelin as a collateral sulcus, but it doesn't look that it goes penetrates as deep as in face selective regions. And we can quantify this. So basically we're just gonna measure the optical density that's related to the myelin density as you go from the peel surface into the um, white matter. And this is shown here in this graph here. And you can so see that as you go from the peel surface to the white matter, you have more and more myelin and um, in the face selective regions. So the critical thing is if we're gonna have more myelin in the face selective regions than in the play selective region, so when we do the same kind of measurement in the place selective regions, we see the same kind of increase from the PL surface to the gray matter, but overall less uh, myelin in the place selective regions than the face selective regions. And we did these measurements in five brains and they're all very consistent. So basically uh, we have some evidence that this uh, proliferation is tied at least partially to myelin. We don't think it's only myelin because we did some simulation and other factors in addition to myelin uh, have to contribute to this tissue growth. And we think that if we look at the monkey data, it's probably related to additional changes in, in tissue properties such as increased dendritic arborization and synapses. Okay, so I talked a lot about uh, uh, structural changes, but you might be wondering, okay, this is all good, but how does tissue become more selective and how it might it affect function? So the last part of our talk, I want to talk about some of our functional measurements that are tied to these hypotheses. So let's think about what would be the predictions of each of these hypotheses uh, in terms of function. So uh, the pruning hypothesis suggests that maybe at, in initially in development, you have these broad areas of cortex that don't show very strong um, responses to a particular categories and they might be responding to more to a lot of categories. And as you become more selective, like the cortex becomes chiseled and basically the regions are gonna shrink and become more selective to a particular category. And this might be associated with a reduction in responses to the non-preferred categories. So you might think about maybe there's a region that responds to faces and bodies, and then it becomes more narrowly tuned to respond maybe only to faces and that would shrink. And a different hypothesis is associated with growth. And this suggests that maybe initially you don't have a lot of neurons that are selective to a particular category. And as you become selective, you have more neurons that are responsive to it. You have increased responses to the preferred category and you would actually see more territory in cortex that becomes selective to a category of preference. So in order to uh, measure the functional predictions, uh, we embarked on a very ambitious a longitudinal studies tracking children a, across five years. So we recruited 40 children between the ages of five to 12. A, on average, they're about a, eight and a half year old a, when they started the study and they participated in fMRI experiment over a span of between two to uh, five years. And on average, we have a measurement spanning four and a half years in, in our participants. And in our ex functional experiments, participants go into an fMRI scanner and they see in short blocks of four seconds, um, images from a particular category. And we have images overall from 10 categories in the experiment. And so our participants see numbers, they see pseudo words, they see limbs, 
headless bodies, adult faces, child faces, cars, guitars, houses, and corridors. And we do a lot of uh, quality controls um, in our participants. So especially motion is a, a significant factor in pediatric imaging. Uh, and we also um, measure task performance. So we know that our children are attentive to our stimuli. So we have uh, data from 29 children uh, uh, over five years or 128 se functional session where we can look at functional changes um, in a uh, ventral uh, stream. So the question is, if we look at functional regions to maybe any of these categories, are they going to grow across childhood development or are they going to shrink? That's our first uh, question. So to do that, we measure for each category within a uh, ventral temporal cortex, how many voxels are selective to any of these categories. So here you're going to see some scatter plot just showing you some uh, raw data. Uh, we're going to show you um, the volume of category selective activation in cubic millimeters as a function of the participant age. Each participant is going to be a dot, and participants of the same data from the same participant over year is going to be colored in the same color. So um, this is such an example scatter plot, and if you can and you can see that if you look at how many voxels in the ventral temporal cortex respond to words, the number of such voxels increases from age five to age 17. And in order to quantify this, we run a linear mixed model that um, measures the change in a uh, volume of word selectivity. And this is the prediction of the model and the confidence interval. And you can see that there's a significant positive slope showing a growth in the in word selectivity from age five to age 17. If we look at face selective regions, we have less overall voxels that are face selective than word selective in the left hemisphere, but you can see also the significant increase in how many voxels see are selective to faces in adolescents compared to small uh, children like our five and 17 year old. So this is data that's also consistent with a the proliferation theory because we have more voxels that become selective to words and faces across childhood development. But to our surprise, we also found actually some evidence for shrinking. So when we looked at the limb selective activation, we found that it's actually larger in young children than uh, in older children. And in fact, if you measure this slope of this development, we find a significant negative slope, meaning that the number of voxels that are selective to limbs decreases from age five to age 17. So I'm showing you an example of, of three categories, but you might be curious what happens to all the other categories. So what we're gonna show you here is basically the slope. So if it's a positive slope, it show increase. And if it's a negative slope, it would be a decrease across development. So these are the slopes uh, across, the, uh, across developments uh, of selectivity to each of the 10 categories uh, and both hemispheres. And I wanted to point your um, attention to several findings. First of all, when you look at the development of word selectivity, it's specific to the left hemisphere, as we find a positive slope in the left hemisphere, but not the right hemisphere. It is also interesting that as word selectivity increases, we really don't see any increases in selectivity to numbers. If you look at faces, you see a positive increase uh, for both adult faces and child faces and in both hemisphere, meaning that overall in both hemispheres and for many types of faces, you have more selective voxels in adults and in children. If you look at uh, bodies and limbs, it is interesting that we find a significant shrinkage of limb selective voxels, but we don't find such a decrease in body selective activation. And in fact, we don't find any significant increases or decreases to the other categories in either oh. hemisphere. The, another thing that we can do is that because this is a longitudinal study, we can align all the data to, of the same uh, participant to their n ear average brain and see what happens to the tissue that changes. 
So here are three example children and the solid region shows the area that's selective to words and blue, to limbs in yellow and faces in red at the first time we scan them. And the out black outline shows this, the same uh, region in their last session. So you can see that for the word selective region, we see this increase uh, in the area and we can see this in also in the face selective regions, but you can actually see how this limb selective region shrinks within the same individual. The other thing that we noted is that the limb selective activation is kind of in between the word selective activation on the left and the face selective activation on the right. So this triggered us to ask if there is this relationship between this increasing uh, word and face selectivity and this decreasing limb selectivity. So what we did is that for each child, we identified the region that's growing or shrinking. So here we're gonna call, look at this emerging word selective region, which is this kind of blank region, which was initially not selective to words, and then eventually it became selective to words. And this is region, we measured the selectivity to each of these three categories, to words, faces, and limbs. So let's look at the right panel and see how does selectivity change across development. So this is the average selectivity of our children when they're five to nine-year-olds. And you can see that word selectivity is pretty low. It's something around two and a half. You can actually see that uh, uh, as word selectivity is low, the limb selectivity is actually positive. So this region actually responds preferentially to limbs, but you can also note that face selectivity is negative. So it doesn't really like faces. So initially it has low selectivity to words, but has positive selectivity to limbs. If we look at the same region in the 13 to 17 year old, you can see that the word selectivity has increased because now it's darker red as shown in this bubble. And you can see that limb selectivity has really significantly decreased and it's actually gone to zero as face selectivity uh, has even further become more negative. And we can see this kind of uh, uh, effect in each of our individual children, as you can see here in this 3D plot, plotting word selectivity as a function of face and limb selectivity. You can see that in all these children, the word selectivity increases as uh, limb selectivity uh, is lost. A similar analysis in the face selective regions shows again that initially face selectivity shown here in light pink is low and it becomes higher. And this is expected because this is the emerging face selective region. But you can also see that as face selectivity grows, limb selectivity uh, is lost. And there is only a very slight change in word selectivity. And this is really interesting because it shows that development of selectivity towards faces and limbs are linked. And it suggests this kind of cortical recycling where limb selectivity gets transformed to a word and face a selectivity. Another question that you might ask yourself is like, what is happening? Why is this limb selectivity lost because responses to limbs decrease uh, consistent with pruning or responses to faces and words increase. So let's look at the signals to these different categories in the emerging uh, word selective regions. So the lighter colors are the young children between five to nine year olds and the darker colors are the older children, the 13 to 17 year olds. And this is a, just the responses to the, um, these different categories. And you can see that there's a significant increase to words in this emerging word selective regions with no significant changes to the other categories. And similarly, if we look at this emerging face selective regions, we see this increase in response to both child and adult faces um, across development with no significant decrease to the other categories. So this suggests that in this region that's emerging, basically face or word selectivity increases and this is what's triggering this change in selectivity. So uh, together we find a lot of uh, structural and functional evidence supporting the proliferation or growth hypothesis. We see that there's an increase in face and word selective regions with age, and this is associated with increased responses to the preferred categories. 
while we saw decreases in limb selective regions, it doesn't really follow the predictions of the pruning hypothesis because we don't really see decreases in the responses to the non-preferred category. So we suggest that there is a, a need to update um, developmental series and that development might be associated on one hand on, on functional growth of face and word selective regions, and on the other hand, a recycling of um, limb selective regions. And in particular, we think that limb selective regions that are uh, selective in younger kids uh, are recycled into word and face selective regions as children grow. Uh, and basically, uh, we have responses to an, an initial category that is limbs that are now decreasing as responses to other categories are increasing. So why is this cortical recycling happening? So uh, what we hypothesize that this cortical recycling is happening because the visual demands and frequency of visual stimuli that are socially and communicative really relevant might be changing across childhood development. And this is based on some other di diet from young infants that suggests that our visual diet or what we look at really changes a lot across development. And for example, uh, young toddlers look more at hands um, than uh, uh, young infants as they actually look less uh, at faces. And we think that later in childhood, there's also a change in what we look and how much time we devote to social stimuli. So maybe when you're young, looking at your limbs uh, really makes sense as you're learning to manipulate the world and maybe get uh, social information from very coarse communicative cues like gestures. But as you become more refined uh, in uh, maybe an adolescence, uh, more information ab about social cues comes from faces and from a uh, reading. And this change in like your visual diet and also in your uh, attentional demands might lead to this cortical recycling. Now, this is a hypothesis that of course needs to be tested in future research. Uh, and another thing that we're really interested to know if this cortical recycling um, extends to other systems. If for example, you might imagine that if you learn more than one language, you might kind of encounter similar such situation in other systems like the language system. We also don't know um, if there's this critical period during development that this cortical recycling could happen, or maybe uh, it can happen throughout the, the life span. And finally, we're really interested to see what happens structurally to these cortical regions that are, are functionally uh, recycled. So uh, I would really want to thank you for your attention. And I would like uh, to acknowledge all the people in my lab that have contributed uh, to this uh, research. Thank you very much. That was a fabulous talk. It did, it wasn't fast. I was able to follow. So thank you very much. It was great, fantastic. I would love to take questions from the audience. I don't think I see anything in the chat box. If people would like to unmute themselves and ask questions, feel free to do so. So wonderful talk, thank you. Um, was was there a task for your your last study, uh, the longitudinal study, or was it passive viewing? And there was a task we called an oddball task. So in each uh, trial, it's four seconds long. There are eight stimuli, and between zero to one to two stimuli in a block, uh, it's just like a blank background with no object, and these participants uh, are asked to indicate. Um, when uh, such an oddball appears. And, and we chose this task because uh, young children can do it really well. Uh, uh, so performance of all our participants is about 90% and higher. We also ha have an uh, eye tracker during the scan and we look at the subjects to ensure that they are looking at the stimuli uh, at all times. Rachel Kalanit. 
I was just wondering whether you think that glial cell proliferation could also play a role here. So uh, when you're talking about the T1 relaxation times, you talked about um, arborization, for example, but could that also play a role? So is this is Sylvia who's talking. I can't really see. Sylvia. Sylvia. Okay, good. Hi, Sylvia. Um, so we think that multiple tissue compartments could be development developing. One of the things that we looked at in our initial study um, is if also the number of neurons can change across development. So we compared our cytoarchitectonic data to our, the structural data. And it's actually that the collateral sulcus is more cell dense than the fusiform gyrus, so we, in adults at least. So we don't think that cells are growing. However, um, glia and astrocytes are really interesting for us, especially because they might be pre precursors to myelin. So um, I'm actually working in collaboration with Mercedes Pardes. She's at UCSF in the anatomy department, and we're staining for multiple tissue compartments in some pediatric tissue samples that she has. And we're standing for four things. We're standing for cell bodies, we're standing for neurons, we're standing for myelin, and hopefully we're gonna be standing for astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. So I don't have an answer now, but I think this is a really important question. And maybe in several years, I could actually give you real data. Very exciting, thank you. Elinate, this is Dick Aslan. I wonder if I could ask a question, uh, two questions actually. Um, thanks, that was a really great talk. Um, if you think of the, you know, the classic work by Hubel and Weasel and Mersnick, there was a competitive interaction between, between sub areas and cortex. That is, they, they compete for space. I wonder if you, if you see evidence of that, because obviously these regions and ventral cortex are adjacent to each other. And, and my other question is, what's the speed of reorganization, right? You're talking about things that happen over multiple years, but is there evidence you know, like the Grievel studies that, that this reorganization might happen at a faster time scale. Okay. Hi, Dick. Good to see you. I haven't seen you in uh, several years now. Uh, so at least good we can see on Zoom. So these are really good questions. Um, another version, uh, uh, as you mentioned, is this version of a functional competition. And this has been articulated really clearly by two uh, leading researchers. One is Marlene Berman at CMU, and the other one is Stan Dehan, who is in France. And um, one of the things that uh, people found early on, especially Rafi Malas' group in like about 20 years ago, is that both face and word selective regions are sitting in tissue and ventral temporal cortex that's associated with processing of fovea. So basically you need really high visual acuity in order to look at faces and also to read words, right? You can't really read in the periphery, right? Uh, you can't recognize a face unless you're looking at them. So they had this idea, especially uh, Marlene and Stan, that you, what's really kind of unique about people is that you learn to read like you're only around five and six. And this is partially why we look at this age group. And maybe this competition between reading and um, and faces on foveal resources would lead to this competition. And in particular, Marlene has hypothesized that the connections with the language areas that are left lateralized would lead to words winning on the left hemispheres and faces winning in the right hemisphere. So this is where we started. Our prediction was if they're right, we should see this competition between faces and words. Um, we do see some evidence for lateralization because I showed you that we see this increase in word selectivity only in the left hemisphere, but we do actually see a development of faces in both hemispheres. So it's not like that clean across hemispheres. And, but surprisingly, the competition that we found is not between faces and words, it's actually between limbs and the other stuff. So that doesn't really match the predictions of this theory. Um, the other thing is that I don't really think that it's just about cortical uh, resources because we have a lot of neurons in a single voxel. So even in a single voxel, we might have 50,000 neurons. So I really don't know how many neurons we need to recognize a face. 
but it seems to be too much for me that it's just about like how many neurons that we have that you would need to go through this cortical recycling. So I think it has to do more with your experiences. It's a, it's a hypothesis. I might be wrong. I'm fine. This is why we have hypothesis. This is to set the next set of studies and I'm happy to learn more. But this is why I think it's not just about competition. I think it has to do with what do you do with the stimuli and which stimuli are important. And uh, I, this is why we have this idea about visual diet. Um, and it's not only about diet, it's about what you pay attention to and what you process. So this is kind of my, it's my hypothesis and I'm happy for somebody to show you me wrong, but I think we need more studies to figure this out. In terms of the time scale, a Stan Hands group um, has shown that within the first year of learning to school, so they scanned in France, people learn to read at six. So he scanned first graders uh, during six times during first grade. And he can show that these face as these word selective regions seem to emerge. So like in, in beginning of first grade, there's no word selectivity. By the end of first grade, there is some word selectivity. So some of it might happen within the first year of reading, but in our data, the biggest difference is between adolescents and little kids. And I do think that this really extensive schooling and like reading long words and having more complicated concept is really happening uh, across uh, adolescents. Uh, Sylvia work has shown there's a lot of changes also in the prefrontal cortex happening in this uh, time scale. So I think some of this has to do with very prolonged and extensive uh, training. Other questions? I is have, is there anyone? There's anything? a question in the chat. Oops, sorry, Nancy Young. Uh, let me try reading it and then Nancy, please do unmute yourself and elaborate if you would like to add. Might the decrease in limbs be related to less movement as children grow? My understanding of the research and physical activity is that children and adults are not moving as much as they should be, but young children are very active. Schools are trying to get children of school age to learn to stay still. Uh, this is a really good question. I don't really know the answer to this question, but um, I do think that it's not only about the movement itself, it's about learning motor movement. So this is very anecdotal, but my experience was my children as they learn skills like riding a bike or riding, that they spend a lot of time looking at their own body uh, as they learn, right? So you kind of like look at your hands or look at your feet. Uh, I remember having telling my kids, you have to look at the street, not at your legs. They'll still move even if you're not looking at them. Um, so, uh, so I think, and it's of course, there's all this uh, motor mirror neuron work by uh, Rizzolatti and colleagues that suggest that as you learn uh, motor skills, it might be beneficial to look at other people's uh, actions. So I think it has to do about learning motor skills Maybe that's tied to movement, but I don't really know because I haven't measured it or seen specific data about that. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm outside and I'm on a golf course and there are these lawnmowers, so it's very noisy. So thank you very much. Can I ask another? Please. I'm not a neuroscientist as Fumiko knows, but I'm uh, a reading specialist and in my own practice, well, for about 20 years, I've been using a lot of movement with young children to teach skills. And I've investigated a lot of that research. And so I'm interested in the advantages of using movement in the young age when, even though I know what you just said, but what if you take the gesture research and the movement research and take advantage of the fact that young children like to move at the same time as you're developing that? Yeah, I think it's a really good thing. And one of the things that we really want to do is like actually get some behavioral data in the real world, like actually know what, we don't have data on what kids look at or as to your point, how much time to spend moving. And I think that is gonna be really important for the continuation of this research. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Uh, hi, yes. I have a question about, uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but I have a question about the definition of uh, category selectivity, because I noticed that sometimes you use like uh, one category versus the main of all other category, but sometimes like uh, in the baseline, you delete one uh, category. So I, I don't know how to explain or how to define the uh, category selectivity. And this is one question. And other question is, it's, it's interesting to see the competition between the limb and the words. And I was thinking about, about the category of tools because in previous study researchers, they added the category of tools. So um, I was thinking, uh, have you observed like any relationship, relationship between the tools and the links? Because they are, for me, like they are most like hand, hand related and uh, and uh, in, in, our, in my data, I always uh, see greater activation of tools in the, in the VOTC area. So I don't know. Uh, and it's hard, we, uh, when we add up the category of tools, it's harder to, fi to find the other category uh, selective uh, activation. So I don't know if you have seen this, this kind of uh, patterns. Thank you. So let me answer your uh, many questions one by one. So let me just go back a little bit. It's true that I haven't said here how I define category selectivity, so I do want to say this. In all our studies, we always define one category versus all the others. And the reason that we do that is because if you just take two categories, there might be a third category that might actually be higher than the two that you're testing. So we feel that the best test is to compare one category versus everything else because we think that's like the most fair thing to do. So that's what we always do. Sometimes we have reviewers that ask us, what happens if you take this category out or this category out? And this is actually why we have, if you look at the paper, we have a lot of controls for taking limbs out or taking words out because the reviewers basically ask us what happens when you take this out, so we just did it. But this is not what I like to do. And I'm really feeling strongly that you have to do one category across many others. If I had 100 categories, I would compare them to the other 100. The other thing is about the stimuli that we use. We did use guitars for the purpose of tools. The way that we define a category, it, may, it has to have the same um, parts and configuration. So we call this a visual categories and I've done this consistently for the last 15 years. So I really feel that we need to have like a definition of what we call a category. And this is my definition of a category. This is why I don't like the category of body parts because I don't know how to compare a limb with a torso with a headless body. They don't have the same component. I don't know what to do with tools because different tools will have different parts or configuration. So as a proxy for tools, we have, it's called here guitars, it's actually string instruments. So it's a variety of instruments that you would manipulate. So that would be why it's a proxy for tools, but these instruments always have a neck and have a body. So they would be like violins, guitars, banjos, blah, 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 things like that. So this is our proxy for tools. And we don't really find a guitar or a string instrument area. We don't really see it changing across development. But this is kind of why we did this kind of analysis in a very um, data-driven way. We just measured this for each category across a large swath of cortex. We didn't define any ROIs. We didn't care if the voxels were clustered at all. And we measured for every single category if it increases or decreases with development. And it's always one category versus the other category. So it's very data-driven way. I think it's very unbiased. There's nothing that I could have done to generate these results by selecting anything. It's just done by code, basically. So this is my answer about, I think I've answered all your questions, but I'm not sure. Thank you. All right, next question by Sylvia. Hi again. Um, so I'm sure you've been thinking about this, Kalani, but all these kids who are not getting enough uh, exposure to faces during the pandemic, right? Um, are you or anybody else gonna have the opportunity to follow some of these kids longitudinally to see whether or how much they're catching up? So this is a really good question. Um, we haven't done anything specific, um, but I think there are 
couple of interesting things about children in the pandemic. One, you're pointing out that their social circles are much more limited because of the, you know, everybody's kind of in their own homes or very small uh, uh, social group right now. The second thing is that when you go outside, you all don't see the whole face, you just see like the eyes um, because the, um, you know, the face, is, the nose and mouth are covered. So that also might um, affect which uh, facial features are important for face recognition. So I think it would be really interesting to see how these kids develop. We've, uh, but we haven't really done something systematic in my lab right now, partially because for half a year we couldn't do anything at all in, in person measurements, period. Thanks. Do you think there will be differences and noticeable differences? And if you did measure and or brought some of these kids back in versus follow them up longer? So if you take my uh, hypothesis about visual diet, then uh, seriously, then if you are me, you should predict that there should be some differences. Mm -hmm. um, and the differences might be in how good they might be at face recognition uh, and also um, which features that they use. Yep. Nonetheless, we see we, from our previous studies that face recognition really changes, and the ability improves, and also these regions grow, if you saw here, all the way to adolescence. So hopefully our world is going to reopen, at least in California, it's supposed to reopen in June 15th. Uh, so this really ties to my second question is like, is there a critical period or is this tissue still malleable for many years? So if it's still changing in adolescence and maybe as kids go back to school, maybe this additional visual um, uh, input would still bring them to where they are. So I, this is why I really don't know. It's yeah. an interesting question. It's um, you, one could almost argue that during COVID, you almost you saw more people during Zoom if you were lucky to have Zoom classes and so on. And then once it's more open, you have to wear a mask when you go back to school. So you see less of less portions of the faces, even though it's more social and human in-person interaction. So it's kind of interesting. Um, great. Thank you very much. I, if, does anyone else have questions? I have many, but I can ask just one question and then maybe we will end, but um, so you've talked about within generation or within years, uh, developmental changes. And I'm wondering if there's any impact of sort of um, intergenerational sort of impact. It could be, I'm, I'm thinking more about cultural, for example, that you gr grow up for generations where the um, words, for example, or some kind of category, visual categories are less valued. So it could be if you see more animal categories where, and you live in a city and you don't see animals, for example, and if that will have an impact on the next generation even so if you, I'm just making an extreme case, but you grew up in the, in a safari or in Kenya, for example, and saw animals after animals of particular categories. And then one generation uh, in a particular generation, you're brought to civilization and you saw, suddenly saw no less animals. And, and is that going to have, are they going to look more like typical other children who grew up in the city or are they going to be that previous multiple generations? Is that enough to kind of impact and how that might impact? So this is a really interesting question and I can only speculate. Um, so some behavioral data that really should suggest that where you grow uh, impacts your face recognition performance and the most salient behavioral um, phenomena, it's called the other race effect. So if you're, let's say, um, um, growing up in a largely Asian dominated uh, culture, you become attuned to the statistics of Asian faces, and maybe you'd move as an adult to the, maybe to Europe where there's a high um, population of uh, Caucasian faces, you might be less good at recognizing different uh, white faces. And conversely, if you grew up in Europe and saw mostly white faces, and then maybe your work transforms you to Singapore or China, where you see largely Asian faces, you might be less um, good at recognizing uh, Asian faces. So this is 
this suggests that where you grew up and not where your parents grew up it would affect your face recognition ability. Another right. interesting behavioral phenomena is called the other age effect. Uh, so uh, especially old adults are better at recognizing old adults as compared to recognizing child faces. But children are like, don't actually show that. And in fact, they're a little bit better at recognizing children's faces and as in adult faces. So this suggests again that your environment, even during your lifespan, and what is the statistics of faces that you're seeing across your lifespan and also which faces are interesting for you because maybe your kid, you know, you, this is like the teachers the milkman, the postman, it's like, who cares what their name is, who that person is. So basically how much you want to individuate a person might affect um, um, your face recognition ability. So this suggests that your, in, your environment and the attention to specific individuals would affect your face recognition ability more than what would be innate mix maybe uh, or well, that's what I take your generation question to be is it something innate uh, right so how long does for example how many generations does it take to have some evolutionary and maybe epigenetic type or other kinds of impact I guess and is that significant enough to have an impact within the child's kind of development or impact the child's development I guess is um Okay, so I guess my best answer for you would be from a different study that we did, which is called the Pokemon study. So mm -hmm. in this study, it's a study that Jesse Kevin. Gomez led. He's now at Princeton. He has his own lab. But basically, this is why I would argue that's like, it's your own like life. So basically, what we did is we scanned people who are young adults between 20 and 30, who were Pokemon, um, experts in adulthood, but basically they spend a lot of their childhood between five and eight looking at this Game Boy Pokemon uh, game. Uh, and um, basically we compared them to age, age, the same age adult that didn't really spend hours and hours, hundreds of hours playing Pokemon on their Game Boy. And we like these Pokemon uh, uh, children because the Game Boys, these are children that were born in the mid or early 90s. And they played this really kind of not so good video game where the Pokemons were small and grayscale and pixelated and were always in this corner of the screen. So it's kind of a controlled visual stimulus. And basically, if you look at the ventral temporal cortex of these Pokemon experts or regular people, they have the face selective regions, they have the word selective regions, they have... Um, the limb selective regions, they have the regular organization, but um, it's only in the Pokemon experts that we could actually read out from their brains patterns, a pattern that's consistent for Pokemon. So this suggests that their infatuation and these hundreds of hours spending individuating Pokemon in childhood really shapes the brain. So this is kind of, I guess, my own strongest evidence that it's about your life and your interests more than a generational thing. Well, great, thank you very much. All right, if there are no other questions, thank you so much for staying on over an hour and it was great to hear your exciting new work. Thank you very much. Thank you for everybody for your good questions. Bye.